be tracked down. Um, for generations, there were complaints in Mexico of maroons attacking and, tra and robbing travelers along the Veracruz-Mexico City Highway. Um, there were other bands that also pillaged the white colonialists um, operating chiefly al along main roadways. Others, other maroon groups set up their palenques or communities, especially in the mountains, um, such as the Sierra de Veracruz or the Sierras de Guerrero, which I was talking about earlier. Um, while many of these communities developed an agricultural lifestyle, many of them supplemented their earnings from robbing and pillaging, as I said, the white, the white colonists. Um, in trying to curb this phenomenon of, phenomenon of marinage, the Spaniards used a variety of methods. Of course, chiefly amongst them were punitive. Severe punishments were legislated against runaways, including castration and, of course, death. They also established garrisons who went out in an attempt to stop the robberies and the pillaging. Most methods were ineffective, particularly in the remote and hilly areas of the Guerrero. Where the path of violence was inconclusive in controlling the Maroons, the colonial authorities in two cases agreed to negotiate a settlement with the Maroons, although with some reluctance. The first of these settlements was with the Maroon town of Yanga. Yanga was also the name of their Maroon leader. And by 1608, Yanga's palanques um, were most threatening to colonists. So much so that in 1609, it is believed that a force of 600 soldiers were sent out against Yanga. During this conflict, Yanga is said to have captured one of the Spaniards, but instead of killing him, he returned him to his leader with a letter attached, which said, we the Maroons have withdrawn to an area to free ourselves from the cruelty and perfidy of the Spaniards, who without any right sought to be masters of my liberty. That in attacking the Spaniards' places and plantations, that we are doing nothing but compensating ourselves by force of arms for what was unjustly denied us. And that they, meaning the Spaniards, mustn't think of peace. I want to listen to this carefully. You, the Spaniards, should not think of peace, but you must come and test forces. And to show Gonzalez that he could not claim cowardice and say that he did not know where he, Yanga, was, he was sending the bear back to him so that the bear could lead him right back to Yanga's forces. So basically, here was Yanga saying that I'm not afraid of you. That I've caught one of your men and instead of killing him, I'm sending him back to you so that he can show you the way back to me. Don't think of negotiating a treaty. Don't think of negotiating any peace. You must come and test me in war. Which they did for a while, and eventually, um, in 1630, some years later, eventually the Spaniards sued for peace, and they agreed to a peace treaty. And they established a town, sometimes called Yanga, otherwise called San Lorenzo. Um, nearly 150 years later, in 1768, a second maroon town of Amapa in Mexico was also formed. So here we have an example of Maroon groups in Mexico resisting successfully and being recognized by the Spanish authorities uh, with treaties that recognize their independence. But of course with these treaties, and as you will see with other treaties, especially the Jamaican Maroons, one of the clauses in the treaty was that these Maroon groups who were recognized as independent were to stop har harboring runaway slaves and actually they were to return any further runaway slaves for a fee. Naturally, as you can imagine, that caused a whole lot of problems. In Jamaica, some of the earliest Maroons were the Tainos who escaped Spanish enslavement and Spanish cruelty. Um, later, they were joined by a number of Africans who the Spaniards would have brought to them to be domestic laborers. Um, much of what the Spanish did in the early days of their occupation of Jamaica was cattle ranching. Um, sugar was not introduced at a large scale at the time in the early 16th century. Um, very little gold or silver was found in Jamaica, so the predominant activity for the Spaniards in Jamaica was cattle ranching. Cattle ranching requires lots of large open spaces for thousands of heads of cattle to roam, and it was generally the blacks, African slaves, who were put in charge of, the, of, of, of manning the cattle. This meant at a very early stage a degree of independence for these cattle ranchers because they would be out in the, air, um, in the country areas looking after the cattle without direct supervision of the Spaniards. 
So in a sense, this was the kind of beginnings of early Maranach, because while out there they would have gotten to learn the territory, they would have learned about the plants, learned about the environment, and become very familiar with it. By the time the English then came in 1655, a number of these enslaved Africans had already been working and living in the rural areas of Jamaica for a number of years. Um, and certainly with the attack of the British in 1655, many of them simply ran off and, and formed their independent communities. Um, a, number of, a number of these African slaves sided with the Spaniards at the time of the British. And one of the things that I want to start thinking about when you're thinking about Maroons, because ultimately one of the questions that always comes up when talking about Maroons is this whole issue of the Maroons returning, <coughs> returning slaves and also helping to put down rebellions and, and revolts. And one of the things that I really wanted to think about is to put yourself in the position of an enslaved person who has been oppressed, who is fighting for liberty, who is fighting for independence. And you don't even have to put yourself in the position of an enslaved person. But if you just think generally about life circumstances and people who are trying to make the best circumstances for themselves, when you look at the history of the Maroons, you see many, many instances of that. For instance, as I said, when the British started to invade Jamaica from 1655 and they had a war with, with the Spaniards for a number of years. Initially, a number of these enslaved Africans sided with the Spaniards. One of them was Juan Lebolo, or who was a, made, um, later known as Juan Lebolo. So you may be familiar with that name. After a number of years with the Spanish, and the battle of the Spanish and the British, and he realized that the Spaniards seemed unlikely to win. He simply switched allegiance and went over to the British side and started to fight against other Maroons who remained um, loyal to the Spanish. You may see this as, a, a, as an element of treachery, of disloyalty, but really what it is is simply these groups seeking to find the solution that is going to be best for them and to preserve their own freedom. So the Maroons have a long history of that. Um, certainly after the British took over, more and more of these Africans went off into the area, into the remote hilly areas of Jamaica and formed Maroon community. Initially, under the leadership of Juan de, um, de Serras and Juan Labolo, they occupied much of central of Jamaica, those parts of the island that you see um, highlighted there. But later on, these Maroons started to split into two groups into Jamaica. One group went towards the east and formed, sorry, that should be the other way around. One group went towards the east and formed the Windward Maroons and another group migrated towards the cockpit country where they had the leaves. In Jamaica today there are four remaining maroon towns. But at the times of the treaties in 1739 there were five major maroon towns in Jamaica. In the west of the island in the cockpit country you had Trelawney town and a compound. Towards the east you had Scotts Hall, St. Mary, Charlestown which is in Buckley and Moore Town which is in the Rio Grande Valley. One of the common things about all maroon settlements, as I said, right across the Caribbean region, is their location in inaccessible areas. This is a picture of the Rio Grande Valley, which is going up to Moortown and other maroon areas. Um, there's not a very good picture of it here, but if you look in the top right hand, your right hand, top right hand corner of the map, you see a hill with a, a bare face. That hill is called Watch Hill, and it's a very important hill to the maroons of Moortown. Um, it is a hill that their legend says that they used to wash out on Brit um, for the British soldiers and militia who would have been approaching to attack them um, in Moortown. So, yeah, one of the things that you see is this use of the environment in escaping from, from colonial forces, whether it be British, Spanish, or French, wherever they were in the Caribbean. The cockpit country is not as densely forested or not as mountainous as the Rio Grande, but certainly has a number of underground well, caves and underground rivers. Um, Copy country is a very distinct landscape, as you know. Um, and there's a lack of surface water, which makes it very difficult for, for farming. But a, num a lot of the water supply is actually found in underground caves, as is shown here. For a number of years, the Maroons attacked and resisted, uh, attacked plantations to to gather food, to gather supplies, and of course resisted the British efforts. By 1738, 